I'm a neuroendocrinologist. I have been studying how the brain secretes hormones and how hormones, especially steroids, affect the secretion of those hormones from the brain. And in the course of these investigations, I have been party to one of the great mysteries of life, and that is how you became you and how I became me. In order to understand this a little bit more, we have to bring in a couple of elementary elements of chemistry. The first is cholesterol. Now, we've all heard of cholesterol, how too much of this can blow up your heart, but cholesterol is also critical for life itself. And this is where steroids are made from, from this molecule. And to do that, we have these complex uh, proteins called enzymes made up of amino acids, and these act on the cholesterol to either add a oxygen, add a hydrogen, take off one or the other as well. And after that, this modified cholesterol molecule, which is now a steroid hormone, will then act on another protein that's in the membrane of the cell called a receptor, and it will bind onto that like a lock and a key. And the key in this case is the steroid hormone itself and the lock being that receptor. So you have to have these three elements in order for steroids to function in your body. And the steroid I want to talk about today in more detail is testosterone. Now, we all know Arnie didn't come by this of his own natural ability. He would have had to take some additional steroids. And sure, steroids, especially testosterone, does change your uh, body musculature. But testosterone also changes fundamentally who you were. And there are three aspects to this in terms of this development of sexual differentiation. The first is your anatomy. Do you have a penis? Do you have a clitoris? That's the anatomical aspect. Then we have gender identity. Who do you see yourself to be? And lastly is this area of sexual orientation. Now, sexual orientation is not who you have sex with. Sexual orientation is about who you desire. And I hope by the end of my talk, you will understand that these three elements of sexual differentiation although they might be occurring simultaneously, are three very independent events. And we can look at the multitude of combinations of permutations that make up each and every one in this room. But we have to go way back in order to understand how we became who we are. In fact, further back than this. In fact, we have to go back to the time when we were the size of a pea. And if we look inside that pea, you would look something like this. This is at six weeks after conception. And with a microscope looking into that, and we looked at the reproductive anatomy, we would notice something very striking. Regardless of what our genetics were, whether we were XX or XY, we would not be able to tell the difference between a male and a female. There are three structures there, the Mullerian duct, the Wolfian duct, and the bipotential gonads. And the bipotential means, essentially, it could go either way. It could either become a testis or it could become an ovary. This is important to remember for the next couple of slides. And I just need to give a shout out to an honor student, Josh Gallardo, who did the drawings that you're going to be seeing. Key take-home message. The default is always female. So if nothing happens at that six-week stage, you will develop as a female. So that Mullerian duct gives rise to the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and that bipotential gonad becomes an ovary. However, in the male, we have to have the turning on of the sex-determining region of the Y chromosome, which we call the SRI gene. We have to have that turned on for that bipotential gonad now to differentiate into a testis. And what's key now is that the testis will start to secrete testosterone. And we have a big surge in testosterone from about fetal week eight 
to about 24, this big rise in testosterone. And this testosterone is the critical for both the development of things called the seminal vesicle and the vas deferens. These are structures we call internal male secondary sexual structures. On the female side, we also have this differentiation, and we start with the genital tubercle, the labioscrotal swelling, and the urethral groove. Now that genital tubercle, the default being female, the genital tubercle will give rise then to the clitoris, the labioscrotal swelling is the labia, and then that urethral groove going through to the urethra. In the male, however, it's not as simple as just simply having that rise in testosterone that I mentioned. In fact, you have to have another enzyme, and this one's called 5-alpha reductase, and this 5-alpha reductase, all it does is it adds on one hydrogen group, and it makes another hormone called dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. And the way to think about dihydrotestosterone, it's like super testosterone. This binds to that receptor far more strongly. It stays about in the cell for a much longer period of time. It really is far more potent than just straight up testosterone. And why I'm mentioning this to you is because it's this that causes the male genitalia to develop so that uh, the labioscrotal swelling becomes the, uh, the scrotum. We have closure of the shaft of the penis, and this is the male. Without that, without that 5-alpha reductase, you wouldn't develop these external male characteristics. Testosterone is critical for the development of the internal male genitalia as well as the external genitalia. In addition, testosterone plays a critical role in development of the heart, bone, hair. There's a whole lots of things that testosterone is very important for. But one of the ones that I next want to focus on is the brain. Now, many scientists have shown that there are specific sex differences in the brain. We can take a brain slice, and we can look at a male brain and a female brain, and we can see differences. But this doesn't tell you anything about function. We don't look at those nuclei within the brain and say, well, that's the area that makes you think you're male or makes you think you're female. When we look at behavior, and especially childhood play, we know that this is very strongly sexually different between males and females. And it was always thought, though, or there was a strong feeling that it's because we give kids certain toys. We'll give a boy a truck, we'll give a, a girl a Barbie doll, and that's what affects this childhood play. And then this really important study came out showing that in monkeys, exactly the same thing happens. The male monkeys gravitate to what we con consider masculine-type toys, and the female monkeys gravitate towards what we consider as female-type uh, toys. Risk-taking. Now, everybody in this room knows men take more risks than women. And in fact, we can't do this in uh, the United States or Europe, but in my home country of South Africa, there are insurance companies that specifically only insure women because actuarial scientists have shown that the extent of accidents that women tend to get into are fewer and less severe than what men get into. So they pay lower premiums. So you could argue if you're a woman in this audience, you're actually being done over a little bit by paying more. And then empathy is another key factor that's very heavily driven uh, by testosterone. And on the uh, x-axis, we have increasing testosterone going to the right and decreasing empathy going down. The more testosterone you have in your amniotic fluid, the, the less empathy you express. Now we get into those sexual differentiation elements, gender identity. Now, there are situations where the receptor that the testosterone was binding to does not work. And we know of over 100 mutations in that receptor. And in some of these, it doesn't work at all. And these individuals are known as having complete androgen insensitivity. These persons are uh, genetically XY, but they develop 100% female. 
They don't have a uterus or fallopian tubes. They have a blind-ending vagina. And they have internal testes. So they have large amounts of testosterone secreted in the body, but the body can't respond to it. These persons all identify and they look. They are female. They identify as female. We also know in the very few studies that we've been able to look at the brains of transsexual persons that the, these nuclei I was referring to in the neuroanatomy, these align very much with their gender identity as well. And then we have another condition that op, uh, occurs quite rarely, that bipotential gonad that I was referring to. It doesn't become a testis or an ovary. This is regardless of whether the person is XX or XY. And those persons develop as females. In fact, genetically XY persons with this condition can be treated hormonally, have a fertilized embryo transplanted to them, and they can give, carry this to term in pregnancy. And then we have one more condition here, and that is the one where that we have a deficiency or defect in the enzyme, that 5-alpha reductase. And if you remember, this is the one that took testosterone and made it into that super testosterone. And without that, without that, we find that the person, although they have testes, the testosterone has masculinized their brain, they have external female genitalia. And in the Dominican Republic, this, the incidence of this is very high, and they actually have a term for these persons. They're called guavadoches, which means eggs at 12. And these persons, if they've been raised female, will change to being male. And lastly, sexual orientation. Now, we know that both in those complete androgen insensitive situation, as well as the Swire syndrome situation, where there's effectively either low testosterone or an inability to respond to testosterone, these persons all are attracted to males. So low testosterone is associated with attraction to males. Whereas higher testosterone is associated with attraction to females. And there's numerous studies on animals being done that have shown this as well. And actually, I give a shout out here to Vasantha Padmanabhan's lab that has worked on this for many, many years. And they can show in sheep, for example, that animals treated in utero with testosterone, they will display essentially, even if they were genetically XX, they will show male-like mating behaviors. But does this occur, kind of thing occur naturally in humans? Well, there's a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So your adrenal glands sit above your kidneys, and in this, this situation, instead of making the normal hormone that comes out of the adrenal gland, which is cortisol, the one that when you get a fright or a writing exam is going crazy, that, it doesn't get made. So these persons make testosterone. And it depends on the amount of testosterone, but if they are XX, it'll masculinize them. There's a big range in that masculinization. We have masculinized genitalia. In the extreme situation, this person will be completely male anatomically, as well as in terms of their brain development and their sexual orientation as well. They will have an attraction for females. Interestingly, persons where it's much less severe, there's a much higher incidence here of bisexuality than in the general population as well. So you might ask at the end of this, so where's the idea? Where's the TED idea here? And my idea is this. We grow up in a society where we know it's not acceptable to discriminate against somebody with blue eyes or red hair or a different colored skin. Yet, Discrimination against people with different gender identities or different sexual orientations persists. And I wish that this information that I've shared with you was something that we taught in schools, maybe ninth grade, so that everybody would know that we just are who we are and we're part of this wonderful biological spectrum. Thank you.